you know, we're not charging at the moment for a warlike event to be covered under a cyber insurance policy. And we don't think our clients or organizations that buy cyber insurance um, want that covered. If that is the case, then that's why there is a segment of um, the Lloyd's market that can cater to that. This is very exciting. Welcome to the Unsolicited Response Show. This episode is going to be about cyber insurance. It's kind of a fraught topic for people like me and people in the cybersecurity industry because it's important to us. We know something about risk. We deal with risk every day. But quite frankly, we don't know a lot about insurance. And the more I talk to insurance people, the more I realize that to be true. So I'm trying to bring more information to the community on cyber insurance. For example, we have a couple talks at S4X22. Uh, shameless plug, check out S4XEvents.com. The great debate this year is, will cyber insurance make a major impact on risk management in OT in three to five years? And we'll have one person arguing each side of that case. So we're trying to bring more information to you this way. But I've got two great guests now. We're going to talk about exclusions and setting rates in cyber insurance. So, Liz, if you could bring them up and I'll introduce them. Uh, my first guest you see here is Monica Tiglianu. She is, first of all, I love her LinkedIn uh, title. You are a cyber risk aficionado. I, I love that. That's great. But your official title is uh, as a senior cyber underwriter with the company you recently joined, Munich Re Specialty Insurance. So welcome to the show, Monica. And our second guest is Paul Gooch. He is also a cyber underwriter. He is with Tokyo Marine Kiln. And I could go into a lot of background on both of them. They've both been involved in cyber insurance specifically for over five years and with insurance even longer than that. So I think you're the two right people to at least get us started to learn more about this. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Let's see. So how do we want to begin this? There's two areas I really want to talk about. I want to talk about exclusions, and then I want to talk about rate setting. We're going to start with exclusions. And there's probably at least two areas there that I think have been really hot. One is very hype-oriented. That is the, the Merck case against, against Ace American. Uh, that's the one that got a lot of press. And then the Lloyd Market Association exclusions got less press. That one might be the more impactful conversation. But let's start with the sizzle. Uh, just to set the background, uh, Merck had a $1.4 billion claim related to not pet you damages on an all-risk property damage policy. The Ace American Insurance Company, their insurer, contended that that claim did not apply because of the war or hostile act exclusion. And this went to court. It's actually gone to a couple of courts. Most recently, I believe uh, one of the New Jersey higher courts. And they said that the exclusion did not apply because ACE did nothing to change the language of the exemption to include cyber in this. Of course, this is likely to be appealed by ACE. Um, but Monica, why don't we start with you? What should the insured, the asset owners in this case, take from this ruling? Well, we, we were waiting for this uh, news or ruling to come out for quite some time. The insurance community wanted to understand how the courts were going to interpret the use of the war exclusion because um, generally speaking, the insurance market uh, does not want to cover war or war risk. There is a specialized specialized market within Lloyd's that takes care of that risk. Um, mm. But if you look across like the international insurance market, nobody wants to take that accumulation or systemic risk. So this sort of precedent would have had, um, uh, it, it has a big impact on how we look at uh, the war exclusion. In particular, the fact that um, the court had mentioned that it wasn't fit for purpose for new age um, cyber warfare or cyber specific attacks that would constitute war. Um, does that just to interrupt you there? Does that fit for purpose? Is that a, a phrase that means a lot in the insurance industry or is that just, you know, just words representing a thought? Yeah. So I guess the fit for purpose is the insurance company's intent 
on excluding certain coverages or certain losses. Um, so okay. a cyber insurance policy and even this property policy perhaps did not have any intention to cover war. Ah, um, okay. So the fit for purpose is, was it intended to cover events such as cyber warfare? The court said that it wasn't necessarily intended to do that. It was probably looking at more of the traditional warfare or kinetic type war, um, which was really uh, the topic of conversation in the past, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, actually from 1937, or when was it, Paul, that the Lloyd's Association drafted the war exclusion. So it predates us, certainly, but it, it was developed um, in the context of the Spanish Civil War. So it's uh, definitely not fit for purpose if we look at cyber events of um, 2017 and beyond. Does that mean, and, and Paul, I'll bring it to you, but Monica, feel free to comment on it. Does that mean that the judge viewed this not petcha attack as something that fit under war in general and just said it was not the cyber element was not ever anticipated in the policy or did they just say we don't have to make that determination whether this was war or not i, I realize neither of you are lawyers but how how are you interpreting this as insurers i think the main takeaway is what i said was that the the court found that the fact that the insurer didn't amend the exclusion to specifically take into account cyber type events meant that there the exclusion only applied to physical you know, use of armed force so you think mm -hmm. of tanks missiles that kind of thing so they i think the argument was made that it once he'd proven that that the rest of it doesn't need to be proved because that's the mm -hmm. hurdle that it falls down at so that the, the main takeaway is that it was this should only apply in to physical events so automobile is kinetic which i don't think is always the most helpful term but what you would think of traditional warfare which i refer to as the, the use of armed force um mm. and so because it felt that hurdle it was deemed that it wasn't enforceable under this um scenario uh, I, I think it's just key to just highlight as well and monica did that this was a property insurance policy that, right. that decided to add in some cyber insurance side it wasn't underwritten by a cyber insurance uh team or underwriter um and i'm not aware of any cyber insurance policies that did exclude claims arising from non-pedger that must be clear i don't know that to be a fact but if you notice the high profile cases come under property insurance policies and i'm aware of policy insurance policies that did pay claims arising from um not pedger. oh that's interesting uh, the the property policy is an issue. I'm really surprised by this because this I heard this from Aaron Leverett years ago that that the insurers were worried about this when they had these all risk policies and they they were beginning to specific specifically carve out cyber and sell cyber addendums or cyber policies to this. So it is maybe a bit of a surprise and and uh, Ace might get what they deserve for not following through on something that was known for a few years now is, yeah is, so that, is that a trend in is that a trend in the industry that maybe started five ten years ago well probably a bit of a historical context helps i used to be a property underwriter so i started um taking okay. me kill in um 2009 um and when we talk about the insurance market we talk about hardening and softening so softening means where there's lots of competition uh rates are really lower coverage is broader um retentions are lower that kind of thing and when this policy was issued, the market was rather soft. So ins property insurers were looking for ways to compete. And so they broadened coverage and so therefore more lax on kind of restrictions. And, th and this was actually an affirmative from what I understand, affirmative cover for cyber. Now, recently in the market, there's been hardening because the property market has, hasn't been very possible, frankly. So the cycle has turned, so it's hardened. Uh, so a lot of people have started af being affirmative on cyber exclusions. Lloyd's of London, of which um, the marketplace in which uh, Monica and I both yeah, participate with, but what the syndicates at Lloyd's on had a mandate um, in uh, from the 1st January 2020 that a property policy had to affirmatively include or exclude cyber. So the problem was with, with the silence in the policy where it just wasn't mentioned, whereas now you have to have affirmative. So you have to either expressly include it or expressly exclude it for mm. more clarity. Um, I think the issue with the 
Merck policy, I believe, was that there was cover for some non-damaged cyber insurance. So that was a time, like I said, it was a time of, of a softer market where coverage was broader. You'd be hard pressed, I think, to find that coverage in a property insurance policy today. And as I don't work in that market currently, but that, that would be my uh, understanding. Yeah, so the insurance market actually has created a new section of itself where we intend to cover cyber physical damage events um, and where this concept of whether or not the original work exclusion does apply and how can it be modified to apply to cyber events that then cause physical damage is still something that we're discussing and um, taking into consideration. I think it's um, it was always ambiguous to us um, as to how a um, traditional war exclusion can be applied in a cyber context. What are the thresholds? How can the words be interpreted um, like hostile acts or uh, even civil warfare type um, activity? Um, and that's why the Lloyd's Market Association created versions um, that are more contemporary or um, try to bring in the concepts that we have seen um, being discussed in industries outside of insurance as well. Um, we certainly think that it's a step forward in terms of trying to uh, clarify what the insurance is there to pay for. Um, so certainly not war um, in kind of the physical arena, mm -hmm. but there's also cyber operations as you've seen probably um, defined in some of the, the clauses in November. Yeah. So I guess when I read the case, or, or what the judge put out. In my mind, it said, insurance company, you need to do better with exclusions. It didn't say, hey, these things should be covered. It just, it really said, we're not gonna judge whether it should be covered or shouldn't be covered. We're just gonna say that the exclusions that are there right now um, are not covered. Are you seeing then that a lot of the effort in the insurance industry is trying to come up with these exclusions that will say what's in and out of the policy. I guess you you use the term, uh, Paul, affirmative uh, in terms of trying to be clear one way or the other. Monica, is, is there a lot of action to put more affirmative clauses in these policies? So we always start off with um, the insuring agreements of what we actually want to cover. Mm -hmm. Now, what we intend to cover um, gets stretched out by the circumstance of the event. <laughs> So sometimes you cannot think of everything that um, a company wants to have insured right. um, or the circumstances upon which that claim comes through. And so we have seen uh, losses in the cyber insurance market that weren't intended to be covered. Um, mm -hmm. And because of the way that that language was drafted, it was to the benefit of the organization that bought the insurance. But certainly we didn't contemplate it in the rates that we charged. So that's what we want to avoid. We, you know, we're not charging at the moment for a warlike event to be covered under a cyber insurance policy. And we don't think our clients or organizations that buy cyber insurance um, want that covered. If that is the case, then that's why there is a segment of um, the Lloyd's market that can cater to that or why mm -hmm. in the property market they had to impose cyber exclusion so that it can be rated for and, you know, managed more appropriately, really. Um, so yes, we are taking a look at the words we are using. Um, I think cyber insurance was always um, frowned upon, if anything, at the beginning of 20 years ago in terms of what it could actually provide um, in terms of value for organizations. Mm -hmm. So we expanded that coverage quite significantly. So it originally was just for privacy liability or security liabilities. Um, events and then migrated into cyber extortion or all the ransom uh, payments that we've seen um, rise meteorically um, in the last couple of years. So we're trying to redefine um, the extent to which these policies can pay so that we can be around um, for many more decades as a sustainable insurance market. Yeah, okay, I think that's, um, sorry to to tell me about Go ahead. I think that's key as well. I, I think some if people listen to this or some policyholders may say, well, why aren't you covering more events? Is, is it just the insurers trying to exclude everything because they never want to pay claims? I think just to provide some context, I mean, in insurance, you can think of two 
major loss scenario type of events here, like earnings losses, and then what we might refer to as like capital events, capital event losses. And so an earnings losses is, is something which affects your profitability. So your results in a single year don't look very good, uh, but they're manageable. You, you, you have enough money to pay out all of those claims and you live to fight another day, right? So you're, you're not challenged there. A capital event is much more serious, which threatens the solvency of an insurance company. And at the most extreme end, such events could result in an insurer going bankrupt. In that case, not only is it bad for us, the insurers, because we all lose our jobs, um, policyholders don't get their claims paid because there's not enough money to cover the exposures. And that's the reason why we have war exclusions in policies. So again, as an extreme example, if you think of a property policy, all property policies will have war exclusions because if there was a full-scale war between you know, Russia and the US, I mean, some might say that your property insurance policy is the least of your worries if that happens, but ignoring that for the moment, if there was full-scale war, there's no way that property insurers could meet the liabilities under all of the policies they had in force, so it wouldn't be prudent to cover war risks because they couldn't pay the claims. So cyber insurance, we have the same issue. The problem is with cyber, it is more nuanced in the fact that if your house Dell gets hit by a missile, that's quite a rare thing to happen, right? So it's quite obvious that that may be an act of war. The types of losses that arise from cyber war events are more akin to typical losses we would see under a cyber insurance policy. So just trying to delineate between the two. I think it's key that we stress that the concern is the potential size and quantum of the losses we're worried about. It's not so much a concern that, oh, it's if it's carried out by a nation state, we can't cover it. That in itself isn't the issue. It's the potential quantum of loss and liabilities we would sustain. So a good example is say the Sony Pictures hack, which is you know, widely believed to be the work of the North Korean government. That was an isolated event, wasn't a systemic event. That isn't a, concern, a major concern to insurers. You could pick up that loss and that wouldn't be a major capital event that would threaten your solvency, even though it was widely believed to be perpetrated by a nation state. So the concern is the potential size of the losses rather than attribution. You know, if it's, if it's carried out by a nation state and it's a one-off loss, then that is you know, potentially insurable, whereas a major war event is just not deemed to be insurable. Oh wow, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of ways we could go there, uh, and I do want to get to these new exclusions. But I just have to say, when you said it's nuanced, I think the new is a big part of that, even though that's not part of the etymology <laughs> of nuance. But the fact this is new, we don't have a lot of data on this, and I think there's also the issue. You know, you talk about a capital event. For, for the insurance company, what well, you might have in the cyber world, you might have something caused by a nation state that gets out of control and hits a huge percentage of your policyholders. So in general, a localized event, what if it's a physical war, might do more damage to a specific policyholder. But it's very easy to see scenarios where some cyber event could hit more than half of your policyholders with sizable claims, not may, any one of those claims or 10 of those claims might not be a big deal, but I could see the case where all of a sudden half your policyholders have major claims. And I'm sure that's not something that you plan for in your, in your modeling. You, you would have to charge so much money if that was considered a, a likely risk. Uh, Monica, Feel free to address that. I also wanted to ask you before we moved on, are you aware, Paul had mentioned, are you aware of anyone that's been denied claims under cyber policies for not petcha damages? No, to the best of my knowledge, I, I'm not aware of any. At that point in time, um, the insurance market and still continuing, the amount of purchasers of cyber insurance was not significant enough to even be able to know how that would have played out. So it was still... Um, early days, you still had major um, corporations around the world, mostly um, corporations domiciled in the United States that were buying cyber insurance. So there was an impact, uh, but the losses to the insurance market uh, were certainly not catastrophic, not a capital event. Um, mm -hmm. And it was these types of unknown cyber events that we would have liked to help organizations recover and indemnify them for. It's actually the same event, maybe 10 times bigger in, and the more insurance policies are being purchased that will have a material impact 
mm. on the solvency of the insurance market because there's not a lot of insurance companies that can provide this type of insurance. So the size of the insurance market for cyber versus property is also minuscule. <laughs> if you okay. think about yeah, the sure. amount of, yeah. That makes sense. I mean, it's so new. Um, it's It makes sense. Well, let's talk about now. So Lloyd's Market Association in November put out four cyber war and cyber operation exclusion clauses, uh, which are very interesting. I want to talk about those in some detail. But, Paul, who is Lloyd's Market Association and, and what cloud or impact do they have on the industry? So the Lloyd's Market Association is made up of participants from the Lloyd's Market. So Lloyd's is a subscription market. Uh, so just to explain that, you may, a client may want a policy of $100 million. They may not be uh, you know, a single insurer or Lloyd Syndicate or want to, to write 100% of that. So it will be syndicated. So insurers will take different shares. Um, so the Lloyd's Market Association is made up of in, um, representative underwriters from each Lloyd Syndicate that offers cyber insurance. And really, the, um, the, the aim is to set market kind of standards, um, practices. It's, it's not, <laughs> to clarify, it's not to sit there and set rates. That's, you know, that would be explicitly yeah. anti-competitive, and that's not allowed. Um, but it is, it is to have to, uh, some form of standardization. So we may come up with a market agreement in terms of the kind of information we need so that if you want to apply for an insurance policy at Lloyd's, you don't have to fill in. Yeah, an application form from Sir Jimmy Keown, an application form from Unit Re, an application form from all the syndicates, we can agree on this is the kind of information we all would like. Uh, and so therefore it, it makes the process more efficient. Um, and so the LMA could also issue kind of standard guideline wordings, which again means that if you're placing a risk in the Lloyd's market, if you don't have each syndicate applying a separate clause or a separate exclusion on your policy, you have a common wording that's across the market. Um, and more from a soft level, it's, it's a kind of information and expertise exchange. We all have different skill sets as underwriters and insurance companies. So it's, it's a way of um, really pooling that expertise and, and, and coming up with ways to better serve basically the clients and issue policies that are more, more relevant. So that's what the uh, LMA does. And the impact that um, Lloyd's has generally on the cyber insurance market is that we look at, um, I guess, untraditional risks that exist from a cyber perspective. So things that maybe the U.S. domiciled insurance companies are not ready to underwrite to because we have a lot more flexibility um, in terms of taking that risk or how we take that risk. Um, and typically we enable um, large insurance contracts to be put in place. Um, so in order to uh, purchase an insurance limit that actually is commensurate with the risk that you have to transfer, there's a huge proportion of Lloyd's or London market um, insurers that participate in those towers. So um, some of the primary, what we call kind of the initial insurance markets that set the tone of the coverage, um, uh, including the exclusions that go into these contracts, belong in the Lloyd's market. But of course, we compete against U.S. domiciled insurers as well. So it's um, a guidance to what the market may be doing globally, but it's certainly not going to be the one voice uh, for the whole cyber insurance market. So there um, will still be U.S. domiciled insurers primarily um, that will have the ability to take a different view. Um, but all insurance companies, whether they provide cyber or not, buy reinsurance. Um, and reinsurance is driven uh, from kind of niche places around the world. Yeah. And those guys care a lot about what exclusions are being used in direct contracts with clients because they ultimately accumulate all of that risk. Yep. Yeah, I'm a Berkshire Hathaway stockholder, so I've learned about reinsurance <laughs> from Mr. Buffett. Uh, so what I'm hearing is that these Lloyd's Market uh, Association exclusion clauses are likely to find their way into Lloyd's syndicate policies and, and may be looked at by competitors to say we want to either provide a similar type of restriction or we might want to provide more or less to be for competitive reasons or risk regions. But it, it sounds like these are likely to find their way into some policies. Am, am I overstating that? No, I, I, my opinion is no. Paul, I don't know if you disagree, but um, I actually think 
this is one approach to limiting um, systemic risk or accumulation risk. We have seen other insurance companies actually go broader than uh, war exclusions and actually uh, think about widespread events as a concept of not being able to take that sort of risk um, and introduce sublimits for zero days, introduce sublimits for severity um, or severe vulnerabilities, excuse me. Um, so I think the market is actually um, maybe in time trying to solve the bigger accumulation picture. We think that the war um, debate uh, was pretty clear from the beginning that there was no intention in the market to cover that, but there were some creative contracts drawn up with some um, language that perhaps would have been debated whether or not the war exclusion could have been applied. <laughs> Well, let's let's dig into this. So I have to put on my glasses because it's a fine print here. And we'll include a link in the show notes, and I'll probably post some of this in post-processing on the screen for those watching on YouTube. But I thought, for example, one of the more interesting ones was exclusion number two. And there were the wording, again, you almost have to, I'm sure you in the insurance industry and lawyers are used to this, but the wording is very interesting because they they talk about does not cover any loss, damage, et cetera, of any kind, directly or indirectly. And that indirectly is very an interesting word to me. Directly or indirectly occasioned by happening through or in consequence of. So losses directly or indirectly due to the first clause isn't that interesting. War or cyber operation that is carried out in the course of war. That one is very straightforward. There's definitions for all these terms. There's a definition for war that is pretty much what people would think of war being today. Um, but then it says, and or, and this or is interesting, retaliatory cyber, retaliatory cyber operations between any specified states. Um, and then and or a cyber operation that has a major detrimental impact on essential services, which could include utility services in the definition. Mm -hmm. So I was really caught by this retaliatory cyber operations between any specified states. And right now we've had, uh, we've had years of Russian U.S. contentions about what Russia is doing to the U.S., colonial pipeline being a good example. You know, that would be a retaliation or an action by Russia that certainly wouldn't fall under the classic definition of war, but do you have any view as to what they mean by retaliatory cyber operations between any specified state? Does that mean after war or does that just mean any sort of conflict between the two? So, so the intention here from my perspective and what I have for uh, interpretation is that what you'll find on some uh, policies in lawyers, and this is all policies, not, not cyber, is a, what's referred to as a great power or war exclusion. So this is saying that, okay, the, 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 the biggest type of event we could face would be a great power war. So again, that's an example of a nuclear war between Russia and the US, China and the US. Um, and so here, the idea is that if there was retaliatory cyber operations in that there was a tit for tat and an and a, um, escalation of cyber attacks between two major powers, that could get to a level where, again, it becomes unin insurable so again if it was a uh, a one-off isolated um event the, the intention is that the the clause wouldn't bite the idea is the idea is to try and clarify that a major cyber uh kind of battle for a bit, between two major states and the, the specified states i believe are like the great uh sort of great powers um China, <laughs> China, yeah. France, Germany, Japan, Russia, UK, or USA, at least in yeah, this so, first edition. Yeah, so that would be the uh, intention of that section clause. Monica's probably got an um, interpretation as well. Yeah, and but it is trying to insert a different type of scenario that is not war. So yeah. it's yeah it's it's the the thing that happens before the real <laughs> the real thing um, occurs and and. Clause. So the, the reason why there's four different clauses is that insurers have different appetites for risk. Um, so some of them may want to use the more restrictive clauses, which are clauses one, two, um, and you can argue three. But clause four under that um, language 
it does mention specifically that these states have to have a major detrimental impact caused to them for that exclusion to kick in. Um, and so I, I do think it's hard to um, explain to an organization under clause two exactly what sort of retaliatory cyber operations do we intend um, to exclude. There are some examples um, that we have seen in the Middle East um, where there have been tit for tat um, cyber events. Um, and certainly they're not listed within this um, clause, but if that had happened between the US, Russia, China, all the specified states, we think that the capabilities um, of those individual countries are beyond um, what we would intend to cover in, in the cyber insurance market. So the loss that happens as a result of it would not be contemplated. And we, we believe, and so Paul and I have not been necessarily part of the initial discussions um, mm -hmm. of this LMA committee to release the clauses. So we're um, certainly speaking from or the best of our knowledge of why these countries were chosen. Um, it has to do with what Paul said, with traditional war exclusions, just or even war policies taking out coverage for these mm -hmm. um, great powers. But it's also because um, there's quite a lot of exposure. So there's insurance policies in those states. So that's where if something did happen, that's where all the major losses would um, predominantly stem from. But I guess, are you seeing, for example, cyber operations they use a lot? Uh, mm -hmm. retaliatory, or it, it even says the third clause, or a cyber operation that has a major detrimental impact on mm -hmm. uh, the functioning of a state due to the direct or indirect effect of cyber operation on an essential service in that state. And utilities are essential services. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if, like, under this clause, I wouldn't think an attack on, a cyber attack on Colonial Pipeline, which is responsible for half of the gasoline and jet fuel in the eastern United States, about a sixth of the country, that would seem to be a major detrimental impact if a sixth of the country can't get fuel. I would think for utilities, this clause would be a little worrying that, uh, that it would not be covered. Am I overestimating this exclusion or is that what you're seeing as well? Certainly, from my perspective, the exclusions are not intended to take away cover for one incident that affects um, one entity as a whole. And the types of losses that we saw out of that event would not necessarily constitute um, catastrophic events. It's the major detrimental impact threshold, um, at least in discussions um, with legal um, experts, is considered like when you see it, you will know it will have a major detrimental impact on the functioning of a state. So it hasn't necessarily been seen in the context of cyber, uh, but there has to be some sort of um, test for it uh, within the courts. And I am thinking about the English courts. I'm not quite sure about the US and how mm. that could be interpreted there. Well, we did have people pumping gas into plastic bags. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> out of fear and, and that was only six days in if, if it had stayed down for a month uh it probably would have as as various places run out of gasoline it might have had something uh paul is is we see this in the security world sometimes with standards government standards that are very very loosely written and then over time there's sort of interpretations and guidelines for auditors for example as to what did what did what does this actually mean in practice sometimes those get written into the standards sometimes they just become a practice for the audit committee does that happen in the insurance industry where you you have something like this that could be interpreted various ways and over five to ten years people all yeah. understand what it means so our equivalent i suppose in the traditional would be precedent in terms of litigation so claims being played claims being denied so that the, the, the the Merck example being a good one, where now there is a precedent for that kind of case. Mm -hmm. So that's what um, we would typically rely on in, in, in that sense. Now, it, another perhaps 
uh, softer way of, of, of doing that is if we see more events we can tailor the wording to say that okay in in certain type of event then this would play out and i think as we spoke about earlier you said the key part of nuance is new is that we're seeing cyber events play out in that, well similar ways but then they develop and evolve so they play in different ways so over time even if there are no claims denied using these exclusions we may see events where clients say mm, this looks a bit of a gray area where we may look to say okay we can clarify the intent um of the of the warnings here but yeah the, typically the, the key issue is precedent legal precedent um, and that's across you know, lines of insurance mm -hmm. it is important mm -hmm. for um, organizations when they purchase insurance to have agreement from the markets that they're buying it from that their intent is similar so that you don't end up buying let's say 600 million worth of insurance and everybody that is contributing to that 600 million has a different interpretation of what they're covering mm -hmm. um, so that's what we would like to do as a market um, I think that there is an element of competitiveness and innovation that can drive better results for clients so we certainly don't think this edition or version is going to be around or you know in the same format for the next 10 20 years um there has to be some sort of discussion though because i i, I do think burying your head in the sand which um i guess at the beginning of how the market started we didn't necessarily see the not petia events but now that we know about them we know that there is a different version that mm -hmm. may be on the horizon well. Just one last thing on this, and then we'll move move on. I, especially, this would be of interest to my audience, people more in the cybersecurity than in the insurance realm. They do address attribution in this market exclusion. Like, how do you know whether it's one of those actors that we talked about? And essentially, the the clearest way is if the state, the country that was where the attack took place, where the damages were done, if they attribute it to one of the other specified states, then it, it that is considered attribution. So if the U.S. said Russia did it, or if China said the U.S. did it, that would be accepted under this exclusion. That's that's pretty clear. They, they do have some language people might find interesting if that's not done as to pending attribution, where it's not known, or where the country or state chooses not to ever attribute it attribute it to anyone. So I, I think that's interesting, but I, I was glad to see that they addressed that in in this uh, market statements. Uh, before we move on, are there any other thoughts or issues that you think are important for the cybersecurity community to know about these potential exclusions? I would say, putting a positive spin on it a bit more, that I understand the concern around exclusions and potential gaps in cover i would also say that the insurance market has paid out hundreds of millions of dollars of claims and the war exclusion hasn't been an issue the high profile events we've seen have come from property insurers who perhaps didn't realize the scale of the exposure they had under their policies that's my kind of mm -hmm. inference not any knowledge and so it, no doubt it is a concern but i would say that you don't get caught up in a perfect solution fallacy where if if you're not 100 percent certain of every single event how it would play out therefore the insurance is not worth it we've got a lot of claims data to prove that there are you know multiple multiple events that have nothing to do with war and the war exclusion isn't uh, invoked so i understand the concern but i would put it in some perspective um in terms of yeah, the 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 usefulness and efficiency of cyber insurance policy in doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's 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 a tool for um, the cyber insurers to utilize in order to offer more insurance globally. So if we are going to help risk manage this very complex peril, as we call it in insurance, um, we need to have some certainty about the type of capital events that we are not trying to ensure so that we can provide um, small, medium sized enterprises anywhere in the world with that sort of cover. And I know that there is concern about collateral damage not being covered in some policies, but clause four, that is the whole intent of that clause is to help organizations get that certainty that if you're not um, uh, the primary asset that is being impacted, uh, if you are a bystanding asset as per that definition, there is intention to cover 
uh, unless it's war. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to say that, um, you know, questioning this language does not mean that I, that the language is not a good thing. Having, I think you use the terms affirmative um, in terms of saying what's covered and not covered. So the more that the industry understands what's covered and un and not covered, it's a good thing, right? Then they can make informed decisions. It's almost like we deal with with risk. The more we understand risk, the more we can decide whether we want to spend time or money to address the risks in, in cybersecurity. So all of this is good, and it's certainly a lot better than I, I put a blog on this. My professional liability insurance was adding exclusions. One of them was it's not covered if the solar winds vulnerability is not patched and used. You know, I mean, thing, things like putting exclusions on individual vulnerabilities uh, seems like a very bad strategy. This seems like a much better approach. So I, I'm positive on it that way. But if you talk about clause four, it was interesting because they they brought this idea that if you were a company and insured that was not in the country that was being attacked, then you would be covered. And of course, I immediately thought of multinationals. So let's say I'm ExxonMobil and I have, well, ExxonMobil probably self-insures, but let's say I'm a large manufacturer that has factories all over the place and I get hit in one country where an exclusion would apply, but then it spreads to all my other countries. I, I thought that was kind of an interesting scenario uh, for clause four. Do you think, do you think clause four is, is workable? I, there's a real life example of a multinational that had that situation happen in, in 2017. Um, and yeah, as long as the loss is happening outside of the jurisdiction in which the initial attack or event happened, the intent is there to cover the bystanding assets. Um, it's not to take away the entirety of the impact from that multinational. Otherwise, um, and I'm, I'm certainly speaking on my own uh, professional mm -hmm. ability to underwrite, otherwise it wouldn't be uh, good paper to buy, good insurance contract if um, your loss at, at the headquarters would not be covered simply because a subsidiary, which had maybe not the same um, exact controls or the effectiveness of the controls could be um, discussed. Yeah. Uh, well, it just shows the challenge with this market, right? I mean, that's that's something, again, that is less... There are follow-on effects to war, obviously, but in cyber, you're talking about potentially direct effects. The attack spreads all over the place in your country or in your company just because all your systems are internetworked, all your people and your systems are talking to each other. That's just another challenge for the industry that I'm sure they'll work through. One of, Another thing Aaron always told me is that insurance companies are very good at dealing with new lines of business. You know, and he goes back to the piracy example and things like that, that, yes, at the beginning, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of uncertainty. Maybe the waves of change are a little bigger at the beginning, but they, they dampen down to an acceptable level. Uh, I do want to hit one other area. This this went on and on, but it's a fascinating area to me. But let's talk a little bit about rates. So I'm talking to Monica Tiglianu with uh, Munich Re and Paul Gooch. Uh, with Tokyo Marine Kiln, both of them cyber underwriters there, focusing on cyber insurance. The setting of rates is really interesting. Paul, I think you mentioned questionnaires early on, um, or maybe it was Monica, but that's what we see a lot of times in insurance, that insur insurance companies will provide cybersecurity questionnaires. And the people in the cyber security industry kind of cringe at them. First of all, there are a lot of work to fill out. Second of all, we we sometimes question the value of those answers. And I know there was an effort with Moody's uh, a while back to create an equivalent of their credit risk, create a cyber risk for companies. They, they partnered with Teammate, and then they created this company, Visible Risk, and now that company has been bought by BitSight with this idea of finding some way of doing that. But Maybe, Paul, I'll start with you. How do you see rate setting in this area changing over the next three years? Do you think it, it will just be better questionnaires? Do you think it will be third-party attestation? Um, 
internal testing? What what do you see as as how rates will be determined for various companies based on their security posture? Sure. Was that a question for me? Sorry, cut out for the sure. Yeah, seconds. sure. You can yeah, start. Sure. Um, yeah. So I I understand the frustration around the cyber security questionnaires, and no doubt clients will see them change every year. Um, but our retort to that is, well, if you speak to any information security professional, they'll tell you that the risk is constantly evolving. So if the risk is constantly yeah. evolving, the information requirements we require evolve. Um, we every risk, every company is unique, but we do see common kind of themes so in a ransomware attack. You do see common themes. Look at a kind mm -hmm. of micro attack framework level. Yeah, there are common steps that we see taken by attackers on that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, rates are. At a very basic level, rates are driven by claim statistics, historically. The issue the submarkets had is that we're a newer uh, industry. So one, we don't have historic history of claims. And also, as we said, because the threat landscape evolves so quickly, data based on uh, claims from you know 2015 to 2018 is less relevant in the current environment where we've seen a huge spike in ransomware claims. So rates will be driven by loss experience chiefly but also with um security so unfortunately where we see a major increase in claims across the board rates for everyone will go up you know the premiums of the many pay for losses a few but there will be delineation between what we deem to be good risks so those with better security um and those with less good risk um in the current market if your security is particularly but what we would need to be poor, you may even struggle to to secure insurance because it's almost at, at the current rate environment, although it, some clients may think it's expensive, it's actually not that expensive and a client with very poor security would be deemed potentially uninsurable at the current, current market rates. So rates will take into account claims experience, both market and the client and security information that's provided. We do see more and more companies offering kind of external scanning services. So rather than me ask you to fill in a questionnaire for your company, a scanning of your external environment to, to, to run checks. We we do have the ability to run those with a, a vendor we use. We don't rely on them as much as we do uh, when we have application forms and underwriting calls. Um, the best process we find is for the client to complete an application form and the underwriters to review it. And then we jump on a uh, what we call an underwriting call afterwards to go through any um, particular concerns or nuances in the information that's provided. Because as we, as I say, each risk is unique. There may be a specific reason why a certain control isn't in place that we might otherwise expect. And so it's the constant kind of dialogue between the insurer and the client to make sure that you know, we're on top of things. And, and that will determine how we view the risk and therefore the kind of rate we apply, but also not just rates deductible levels, limits, insurance, any sublimits, mm -hmm. breadth of coverage, it will all um, depend on that. There is a heavy element of risk selection in cyber at the moment because we have seen so many um, common themes and claims we've had that we say, okay, if we only would have been insured clients, for example, with multi-factor authentication or multi access, uh, full deployment of EDR solutions, good previous access management, protection of backups, the you know, offline backups, that would have reduced the huge amount of um, claims we would have seen. So that has to be factored into our rating. So those are the, those are the key elements. So it's a mixture of, of all of those. Yeah. Monica, I, I wanted to give you a chance at this, but maybe focus, I, I think we understand rates go up based on claims, right? Overall, the the increase in rates across a broad community is is pretty understandable. You get more claims, you have to, you know, the numbers have to work out, but more the analysis of one company versus another company. Uh, how do you see that moving in the next three years? Are we going to get better at it? And if so, how? So from my perspective, it, it, it's a hundred percent that is the maturity level of the market, but also it corresponds with the maturity level of the clients um, in respect of articulating their cyber risk. So to, to differentiate between, let's say, a manufacturer um, of cheese, uh, for mm -hmm. lack of a <laughs> better example, and um, a retailer, 
um, we need to understand how those controls were chosen and also the effectiveness of those controls for that sort of operation. Um, and then the retailer, on the other hand, has a completely separate, separate set of controls and the effectiveness around them is different as well. We care about that level of effectiveness and we cannot necessarily compare them to each other, but we can then get threat intelligence on what is actually happening, whether or not certain industry classes are being targeted more or less, um, whether or not their maturity in terms of um, implementing those controls um, is there by industry class. There was a comparison um, a few years ago to say, you know, uh, maybe financial institutions and energy companies had kind of a high degree of mm -hmm. um, security in place versus um, kind of the marine sector, which was always considered to be one of the yep. lowest uh, sophisticated. So th there's that sort of differentiation in terms of rates, but it's uh, at the moment, it's actually a, a pretty binary, I would say. It's either do you have the security in place or do you not? It's not really looking at industry classes per se. Um, certainly the amount of events that have happened in certain um, classes, such as aviation, has really impacted um, the insurance market's appetite around that class of business. And also we realize that the maturity may not be there. Um, but we haven't seen um, conversations about risk that go beyond design. So we have a lot of checklists that say, do you have this control in place? Yes. Yeah. Do you do this? Do you have this standard? But it hasn't evolved because clients are still figuring out how to move to the effectiveness side of what does this control actually do for me? How do I then measure my um, loss exposure? And those numbers, that sort of quantification, although it's not perfect because everything is qualitative and quantitative, um, is going to be very useful for us to differentiate rates um, for different industry classes because a business interruption loss um, at a manufacturer may be very different in terms of severity um, versus an online retailer, which may have quite a lot of resilience um, if, if they have the right backups in place. Uh, yeah, flat. yeah, it depends. I mean, for example, I've worked with manufacturers where uh, a one-week outage is no big deal because they would just run three shifts the next week. You know, so that's there's that kind of right. thing. But I, I do see this this issue of how much information, you know, how much information does it take for the insured and the insurer to generate some feeling of, of the risk of the situation? And there's probably a sweet spot where you say if you ask for all this, it's too much of a burden um, and it's not actually helping you. If you ask too little, you're not getting what you want. Uh, I had one more question for you, and then then I'm going to give you both a chance, you know, if you want to speak to the, the OT security community that listens to this. But I guess my question is, I'm thinking again, a colonial pipeline. So if they were filling out a questionnaire and it said, do you have two factor authentication? They would say, yes, we do, because they did for their employees and their partners. Mm -hmm. But there was a system they were unaware of that was much lower security for remote access. And, and you could have the same example. Do you have a patching program? Yes, you have a patching program, but you're not going to have 100% effectiveness in achieving that patching program. What happens if they make a claim on, on these questionnaires and yet they are don't fulfill what they state their security policy is? And, and that's the root cause of the claim. What what happens there? I have no idea. So I'm really asking for myself more than anything. Maybe others know. It's a very so common this, thing that happens. <laughs> yeah. So this is actually, this is one way in which the, the market has evolved to take into account because it's been quite a common scenario where you ask a binary question. Do yeah. you, yeah, do you utilize MFA for remote access? And mm -hmm. Frankly, insurers and underwriters have deemed that to mean a yes to mean yes across the board, whereas the client has assumed, well, I use it in some places and others, so therefore I am using it across the board. So what we've started doing now is to be more specific. So, for example, with that, we say, do you require it for all employees, vendors, for all types of remote access? Please outline any areas where you do not currently use it. Similar with 
you know, kind of deployment of EDR tools or PAM tools, you know, how many, how many privileged, what percent of your privileged accounts are enrolled into the PAM tool and which ones aren't, and please identify any exceptions. Again, and I was discussing before this call with, uh, uh, with a colleague about subsidiaries. So companies that have lots and lots of subsidiaries, they report on the major company, but there's also a subsidiary that doesn't. Now, for insurances on our claim, we'd have to prove that we've been materially prejudiced by the non-disclosure. So that's that's the the, the, the bar. So if um, you know, if, if obviously the kind of quite basic example is if you say, oh yes, we use MFA, and you have a claim and it has nothing to do with not using MFA, insurers couldn't rely on that non-disclosure because it's unrelated to the, to, to the claim. Now, if it was something that it, it materially prejudiced the underwriters and they would say, well, we wouldn't have taken on this risk, did we know that you weren't, this wasn't the case, then there is a chance that either the claim will be denied or the loss quantum payable will be reduced um, relative to the, you know, the, the seriousness of the breach so but this must happen in in property as well where you'd say for example oh we have a fire suppression system and we have a you know a test plan and and you probably have a variety of questions around certain physical security things and and then an incident may happen where it didn't work right or it hadn't been maintained for you know a, a month or a year or something like that so it didn't do what it was supposed to do because like like i get again i go back to colonial pipeline if you had asked the question do you have mfa for remote access they would have said yes and to the best of their knowledge they were using it everywhere but there was they made a mistake they weren't perfect yeah i how find does, that how to be more that, of a, go ahead it sounds like it's more of a failure of a control as opposed to um you know, yes. kind of in intentionally misrepresenting the risk. So when Paul was saying, like, I want to understand the situations in which you're not putting a control in place is because he wants to determine if the rate or the terms and conditions of that policy are appropriate. So right. if he is, is aware that there could be an estimation, let's say 20% of your environment that does not have that control, um, then he can make a determination if he's willing to accept that risk. But if in good faith, um, an organization says, yes, we deploy it everywhere, but actually they know that it's not actually everywhere. That's, that's where we want to... Uh, take away coverage for known known things okay. that are not um, implemented. Yeah, that, that's a tough one because we know, for example, there's everyone who's done pen tests or assessments know that they find places where the security controls that are approved and actually attempted to be put in place are not done all the way. That's how, that's how they're so successful is they find these holes. Um, Okay, uh, we could go on for longer, but I've kept you for an hour here, so I want to I want to give you back the rest of your day, uh, especially since Monica, you're in London. Paul, where do we find you now? Are you in London as well? I'm I'm also in London. Yes, I'm. Uh, oh, okay, I'm in London as well. So it's getting late for you there. Uh, <laughs> so maybe if you think about my audience is primarily OT security professionals, IT, ICS security professionals who are beginning to deal with, you know, we're the ones getting the questionnaires. We're the ones getting kind of the, the flow down for these requirements. Is there anything that you think they should know or you want to say to them before we close out? Um, of course, you don't well, have one, to, but if there is anything. Well, one thing I'd like to say is I think sometimes, especially on underwriting calls, it, it may come across or the client may feel it's somewhat adversarial in that the underwriter or the, or the insurance is grilling them. And actually, it's all the underwriter or insurer thinks that they know better than the client, and it's almost a opportunity to tell them off. And it's not that at all. Uh, we completely understand that our skill set in this area is lower than the average you know, information security professional. We don't know the risk as well as they do, and we're here to learn. Um, and that's unfortunately sometimes why we have to use more blunt tools like questionnaires because we we can't spend a month with a client mm -hmm. working out the nuances of, of their controls. But I, would, but I would say we're on the same side. And, and one of the uh, things that we are seeing in the market at the moment is, for example, we had a client that the CISO couldn't get sign off for um, a specific security control that was quite important to underwriters. They couldn't procure insurance once they went back to the um, CFO or the risk manager for uh, to say that we can't get insurance out of this. 
they then had the budget increased to be able to implement this series control mm. so they could then get insurance. So if, if any professionals uh, feel like they're being grilled by underwriters, it's, it's, it's really because we need to get as better understanding as possible um, and where there are, you know, there's, some, there's, there's an answer to the question that says, no, we don't have this, but there's a very good reason for that not being the case. And if the, the client can demonstrate that well, we don't do that, but it, either we don't need to do it because of X or we don't need to do it because we have these other compensated controls in place, underwriters are very, well, good underwriters, in my opinion, are very receptive to that. So I just to try not to see it as like an adversarial kind of back and forth like interview process. It really is, you know, we don't make any money if we don't issue any insurance. So we want right. to insure as many people as we can. Um, and we want to partner with clients that have good security. And like I said, if, if we just excluded all claims forever, there'd be no cyber insurance market because nobody would buy it. So there is a there is a balance of, you know, we need to pay a certain amount of claims to, to, to you know, keep demands there. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it flows downhill because, so let's say the insurer asks, sometimes the security professional, this information, well, the security professional in OT, it has the same relationship with the engineer. You know, we're always asking the engineer, how does this thing work? What if this happens? What do you do if this happens? How would you recover? And, and a lot of times the engineers think that the security professional is trying to tell them they're not doing their job right. Or, and in fact, we're just trying to understand. So it, it kind of flows downhill. It just depends which it's a really of the conversation good. you're on. Yeah, it's, it's exactly a really good analogy. That. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's a really yeah. good analogy, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Monica, anything you want to tell the community? Um, I, I think it's important that the community educates underwriters on you know, why they've made those decisions. And um, we appreciate that some of the information that they have to share with us is extremely sensitive. Um, so it's not that um, we want to divulge anything, that we want to know um, the insides out of the architecture of what's going on there. We just need to understand what are the, the controls in place that will make um, those asset owners resilient um, in respect of the most common scenarios that we see from a cyber um, attack perspective. Um, so just a, a discussion, but also them educating the underwriters. I think it's very important um, that it shouldn't just be the underwriters asking questions, but um, the client should be able to explain what their risk is and, and yeah. why they've accepted it for now. It's not designed to be adversarial. I, I think, Paul, what you said and, and Monica said there is that insurers actually want to write a policy. You know, if, if you're not writing policy, if you're not creating this line of business, then, you know, that's that's something that insurers are in business to do. Uh, Monica, where would people find you online? Are you active in any of the socials? Yeah, primarily LinkedIn. So always happy to connect on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm mostly in the background on Twitter, but certainly follow. <laughs> okay. A lot. And Paul, how about you? I'm less active than I should be or encouraged to be by our, uh, our marketing team. I am on LinkedIn. Uh, happy for anyone to reach out via LinkedIn. Um, excuse me, it takes me a week or two to reply because I forget to check. But yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter, but unless you're interested in me moaning at airlines or local retailers or other people for their lack of service. The, the Twitter feed isn't that exciting. So yeah, LinkedIn is the best place. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you both for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks very much.